on 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. 506 Thursday morning, the sixth day of June. It's D-Day Day, the day of D-Day. It's amazing seeing everything transpiring over in Normandy. Uh, we're going to cover that as well this morning and all the news of the day, including at 635, Hans von Spikowski joining us about the uh, the Georgia case against Donald Trump now in uh, animated suspension until the appeals court takes up the question of Fannie Willis. It's a great thing to see. It's not going to happen until after the election. Oh, imagine taking an early plea deal of guilty in that one. Seven, oh, that's right. Hey, uh, Jenna Ellis did that, didn't she? Mercedes Schlapp. That, <laughs> poor Jenna. Yeah. She was Jenna's one of the few, a, but not. She's, yeah, not, I don't know why she not did Not all that. of them did it. Weird. 705, John Solomon on Hunter Biden, but also on, oh, he's got a ton of stories going on right now, including the fact that, the, remember that whole Cassidy Hutchinson thing? Donald Trump tried to wrestle the steering wheel away on January 6th and drive that. The limo driver was never allowed to testify. Wouldn't you want to get the testimony of the limo driver to verify Cassidy Hutchinson? What? I thought Cassidy was limo driver. Did I get it wrong? Exactly. <laughs> Cassidy was actually in charge of the Secret Service detail. She was. She was. She was running the Secret Service. We'll talk to John Solomon about that at 705. 735 will uh, honor our greatest generation with World War II historian Alex Kershaw. And then in the 8 o'clock hour, we're going to cover something about uh, remote learning and how it's actually benefited a lot of special needs kids and other children who don't interact well in classrooms. Well, in Montgomery County and in Frederick County right now, there's a fight to get rid of them, get rid of uh, virtual learning, because, you know, it's helping kids. Uh, at 8.05, we'll speak with uh, an expert on the issue from Montgomery County, and then at 8.35, we'll hit it in Frederick County. It's Larry kind of already brought in Mercedes Schlepp here to the conversation. Good morning, Mercedes. Fresh Good off your morning. trip to El Salvador for See. the uh, inauguration, second term of President Bukele. That is right. We, there was several dignitaries there, including um, Donald Trump Jr. and uh, Kimberly Guilfoyle and uh Tucker Carlson was there as well. I'm sure missing uh, uh, Senator Mike Lee and uh, Congressman Matt G- Gates were just to name a few. Yeah. But you know who also was there? Who? Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Really? That was the beha- representative. He was, the, was he the highest hear, ranking was, official was, there for Biden? That was our highest ranking official. You know who Spain sent? Spain sent the king, King <laughs> Felipe. And Biden sends uh, the Ray. the impeached, yeah. shamed Homeland Security I mean, Secretary, who, by the way, his greatest connection to El Salvador is to allow all the MS-13 murderers into our country from El exactly, Salvador. Exactly. Exactly. It was, <sighs> I got to tell you, what a sh- embarrassing. And then, of course, the you know, there, there's, the yeah. But Bukele gave, a, uh, President Nayib Bukele gave an incredible speech talking about security first in his country, because yep. obviously they've been under an enormous amount of crime. You talked about MS-13. And then uh, now his big focus being the economy and prosperity. Uh, and you got to remember what they're doing. China is the one that's investing in Latin America. And, uh, you know, so, for example, right next to the Palacio Nacional, which is where the event happened, that's kind of their Congress, you have, you know, to the right, you have, if you're looking straight at it, there's a beautiful cathedral. Then to the left is a library, biblioteca, that was built. And you know who built it? Who? The Chinese. Oh, there you go. Oh, the investment from the Chinese in the Latin America. From the Chinese. In the Caribbean. Yes. Oh, the, oh, oh yeah. you, you go to a everywhere. Caribbean island, there's Chinese infrastructure being built everywhere. I know. Yeah. I know. So yeah, he's trying, that's... Naib is trying to bring in American investors into El Salvador, has done a great job of cleaning up the streets. Yeah, because and... you can't blame an American investor for saying, yeah, I don't think I'm going to, you know, um, take a risk on El Salvador, given everything that's been going on in that country. But yeah, you know, in just four short years, he's done a great job. And I, if Trump gets elected, the two of them will get along. They've got, a, I'm assuming, a great relationship. El Salvador could be the next big tourist spot. <laughs> Of, of, it could uh, be. Of, of, of uh, the Western Hemisphere. I, I, when I was there for a quick trip, right after Bukele had been elected the first time, I got to go on a trip with Secretary Pompeo. I would remember going by all of these pristine, untouched beaches along the coast, saying this, this could be the most amazing tourist spot for America. And that's to visit. where Larry was like, I am ready to move down oh, here. I'm, I'm so ready. to build my hotel. Set up my Elon called. Musk Starlink transmitter so exactly. I can broadcast every morning. It'd be so fun, Larry. Come and on, I remember asking that. Bukele, I, I think he had been inaugurated um, just like six months before or three months before. And I said, you know, the, 
big issue with Salvadorans coming into America illegally, and you know, th there's a big effort um, for benefits for them and to allow them to come to the country. What do you want the um, American government to do for the people of El Salvador who are in America? And he goes, my job is to make El Salvador such a great place that nobody wants to leave. They're my exactly. citizens. My, I, I, I'm not interested in pressuring the president of the United States to do for my people what I should be doing for my people. Uh, well, so my, my yeah. I, I mean, and I had never heard a Latin American president because they're always, you know, pounding on the table and screaming that America needs to do more for their people. He says, no, I want to do it's my job to do things for my people. It, it was an, uh, incredibly refreshing yeah. to hear from him. Yeah. And look, he wants you know, he's making it so that people can if they want to become citizens, they're dual citizens, they're bring investment. If you're doctors, if you're engineers, like he wants talent yeah. in his country and Part of it is that one big one big lesson I learned while I was in San Salvador, the, the capital, was that after you've gone through the Civil War, after you've had the communists in charge for a very long time, um, it destroys cities. I mean, it just destroys yeah. cities. Yeah. And you could see that San Salvador, beautiful people, but the city was pretty pretty bad shape well, uh, in terms of the infrastructure and and really Bukele, I mean, he has a daunting task of rebuilding they, San Salvador and and they've and had the worst of both worlds. It's yeah, been communists and it's been criminal gangs. Yes, and and and, and, yes. The, and, and working together and it's yeah. and it's and it's been a nightmare. The, so the the big challenge for Bukele and, and and the criticism that he gets in some quarters is that in cleaning up corruption, he has maybe overlooked some of the more. Um, Western ideals that we right. have in place in terms of uh, uh, the rights of the accused. And, you know, mm. the, the, the trials what do you are mean? very Do we fast even have the rights of the accused anymore? I mean, look what happened right. in New York. With well, I, exactly. I mean, we're, well, that's the thing. We're, we're <laughs> certainly just... nobody to lecture anyone about exactly. that. Exactly. And yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I, they've sort of taken the approach that if you've got a giant face tattoo that says MS-13 on it, maybe you're guilty. Yeah. Maybe you're a gang member. You know? yeah. We don't, we don't yeah. need to have a video of you with a smoking gun to know that, yeah, you're a gang member. You're going to jail. So kids, yeah. don't don't get the face tattoo. And maybe you'll you know, have the a ones that say MS-13 or like, right. you know, Satan or something really horrific. <laughs> yeah. Don't don't put it on your face. I think that it's, your... it's really naive for Americans or people in England or other places who have had, you know, um, uh, the uh, the understanding of of a, a fair constitutionally based jurisprudence established for a couple of hundreds of years, despite the fact that it gets waived in certain times when it's a Republican who's accused of a crime, for us to be able to then lecture a country who has been it would, has been a murderous basket case infested infested Absolutely like one infested. of the murder capitals of the world. That's right. Like, That's right. <laughs> And, you, yeah. and, and when you are faced with that and you need to protect your society, yeah, you have to say, you know what, we know who the criminals are and we're throwing you in jail. And, and that needs to happen to be able to yeah. sort of hit the reset button and actually get things done right. The way, they would, the way they would explain it to me would be holding a phone and your phone. You couldn't walk down the street with your cell phone in your hand. They'd come and rob it. Then they'd take yeah. your watch and then they'd take your shoes. Yeah. They were literally you could not walk out in the streets. Sounds it a was bit the, like New York. Yeah, this is. I mean, City. everyone talks about the, the the triangle. Yeah, a lot like New York, um, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Honduras. Those are the three countries that were the top mm -hmm. per capita murder capitals in the world. We had a huge flood of it. By the way, all this corruption happened under the Obama Hillary Clinton watch during those eight yeah. years. It's where it really exploded. And now we're cleaning up the mess, and uh, this is what it looks like to clean up the mess. And uh, I'm all prayers for Bukele and his efforts down there, because he really does seem like the real deal. And I'm very excited that you guys got to go down there for that event. It was, it was wonderful. wonderful. So uh, let's turn our sights to the basket case that is the American government now and what can be fixed here. Uh, as you know, Donald Trump is actually leading in the polls now. He's actually gotten a bounce after his conviction in the latest polls. And all the rumors are that he is lining up to pick his vice presidential running mate. Who's that going to be? Well, we'll get, tell you what the short list is, and we'll discuss the strengths and weaknesses of each in just a moment. First, though, it's 515. Mark Levin, weeknights from 6 till 9. On News Talk 105.9 WMAL. Making sense of the news. In the early evening, the AP reported that the Trump campaign has asked for vetting documents from a handful of potential running mates. 
Fox News alert. Breaking details on Donald Trump's search for vice president. Reports out tonight that say the Trump campaign has begun the process of formally requesting information from a small group of potential running mates. The vetting process has begun. The potential candidates are North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, Florida Senator Marco Rubio, and Ohio Senator J.D. Vance. Other people are still likely being considered, but this initial outreach suggests that these men are on the top of Trump's list. So Burgum, Rubio, and Vance also, though, on the list and mentioned in the article. Uh, former Secretary of uh, Housing and Urban Development Ben Carson, Senator Tim Scott, Congressman Byron Donalds, and Congresswoman Elise Stefanik. All right, Mercedes, you know all these guys, all these ladies, all yeah, these I... everyone. <laughs> The one I don't know too much about is uh, Burgum, but I've spent a lot, lot more time with the others. What, what do you want to know? What is your sense first? I want to get your sense. Well, you do you think any of these help Trump win, or do you think that that's not really the fact Look, that it's being played I here? Never Wh- really which think... one brings electoral power to the equation? Well, first of all, and I was having this conversation with a, a wonderful one of our wonderful senators. He basically mentioned. The, the biggest issue you're going to have is that is the Florida, Florida thing, right? You can't yeah. run from the same state. So um, so Rubio might we might run into a problem with Rubio and and Representative Byron Donalds and Senator Marco Rubio. They're both from Florida. I don't think they have figured out legally how to do that. So I think you're going to it should run be into pretty that. easy. If uh, my understanding is it's never been challenged. But I asked Mark Levin the other night at our free speech forum on stage. I said, is that yeah, really what a did thing? he say? He said, yeah, it's really a thing. It's in the Constitution. Um, but it's never been challenged. So, but it should be easy. Trump's got houses everywhere. He can just yeah, change he his. Yeah, he could technically. Yes, you. Could he could change his residency change to his New, residency. New Jersey. But and you got to ma- see the timing and all that great stuff, right? So, they're probably going to have to figure that part out. So, uh, look, I never think that a vice president necessarily brings a lot to the table. In this case, it could, in the sense that people could view the person as being the next in line. For the presidency or yeah. if, or if something, God forbid, would happen to President Trump during the next four years. Um, and, you know, the the, I, we, the de- Republicans don't play the necessarily identity politics. I know that sounds crazy, despite the fact that there's like three African-Americans on the list. Yeah. You know, Elise Stefanik, a woman. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you, Elise Stefanik, for example, who I actually love. I think Elise is fantastic. I do, too. She's got a CPAC rating of about 50 50 percent so not not a solid conservative right so in that sense as and but at the end of the day it's going to for conservatives that could be a bit of a challenge right yeah. because they're thinking of the person as next in line mm-hmm. um i would say carson and burgum ben carson and doug burgum are kind of like the senior statesmen right mm-hmm. these are more the their 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 experience they're at a, a different level in their career um and they could be more of the keep calm keep trump calm yeah you know it's like that with sure. the, you know those keep the shirts <laughs> the keep calm shirts the, yes. they're the ones that could, are could be the level-headed they're you know they're they're they might not be the ones to run the next term jd vance i've oh i think he's super strong so i think i like jd vance a lot i think you need someone who's in a strong position that under that really can come in and if we have the senate majority can really push through legislation in the first 100 days um i like having a senator in that sense that would have a clear understanding of how the legislative process works where the vp takes an active role in the Senate. I would love to, mm. I would like to see that. I think that's the way to see it. Make them really well, become the strong leader in the Senate. I'll tell you this as far as like uh, if you look at all of them of all of them with regard to America First policies, I think JD Vance more than any of them, he gets it. He right. gets it. In, it's in his DNA. He gets it. Um yeah. Byron Donald's is right there with him, I think on that. Um I think Tim Scott and Marco Rubio are two names that could actually enhance the ticket in terms of winning more votes. Um, I don't think the other ones really bring more votes to the table, but I can see Tim Scott bringing some votes to the table, and I can see Marco Rubio bringing some votes to the table. Um, Whether that's enough to win a state or not, I'm not sure. Um, But people like them. People well, like we'll win, we'll win South Carolina, right? Like he comes from. Or, South yeah, Carolina. I mean, there are states where you've already got. Scott. The question is, yeah. if you send Marco Rubio into, you know, Arizona, 
does he help win Arizona? If you send Tim Scott to Georgia, does he help win Georgia? I think he could. I yeah, think, Byron, yeah, and Byron Donalds could too. Mm -hmm. I just hate playing the identity politics. I think if you get these good candidates that know how to talk, I, I always think of Senator Pete Dem, D Dominich. No, I'm getting the name. Oh. Pete Dominici? He was Dominici. From New Mexico? From New Mexico. Yeah, his I, daughter I think, is now the Republican candidate for the New Mexico so it, Senate. You know, I admire, I remember campaigning with him back when it was Bush years. Okay, yeah. I was a very young staffer. And he was brilliant at connecting with the Hispanic voters. And, mm -hmm. and you know, so I, I just hate the identity. Pick the guy. I don't think that's – I, I think identity powerful. politics is when you go in there and say, vote for me because I'm this – and because I'm that, I'm going to do this. These guys don't do that. These guys no, don't they do that. All, look, they all bring strengths to the they ticket. Yeah. Byron Donalds is an excellent communicator. So is J.D. Vance. Ruby I'm just sorry to hear that Matt Schlapp has not made the short list. Oh, are you I kidding was, me? They've I was counting on they've, that. They've, just, they've tried to destroy us. They've no... tried to destroy all these people. I uh, not 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 yeah. at the same level. All right. Yeah, not at the same level. More but discussion Rubio, of this as, as the morning goes on. It's five twenty-four. Now, now. on one hundred five point nine FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. Sun is already starting to peak uh, across the horizon there on this June morning. I do love June. When the sun starts coming up so early in the day, Mercedes Schlapp. I do, too. Makes it's me just joyful. the promise of warm weather and just something very, it's and all about. storms. I love the and storms tornadoes. in the afternoon. Unlimited <laughs> possibilities on days like this. So let's seize it. Let's get a hold of it. No one's going to keep us down. Coming up at 635, Hans von Spakovsky <laughs> on Trump's Georgia case being suspended. We'll talk about the details in a moment. Then at 705, John Solomon. A ton going on with John including the Hunter Biden criminal trial. 735, Alex Kershaw is a World War II historian. We'll talk about the D-Day anniversary. And then in the 8 o'clock hour, we're going to talk about the power and benefits of virtual learning. Yeah, that's right. It was good for a lot of kids. And now Montgomery County and Frederick County looking to end their programs. At 8.05, we'll speak about the Montgomery County program with Andrea Levy. And then at 8.35, Frederick County with Jamie Cutright. I'm Larry O'Connor. That's Mercedes Schlapp. Good morning, Mercedes. <laughs> Buenos are you, dias, Larry. Are, are your little ones, I know your your two oldest are back from college for the summer and doing their summer things. Are your little ones uh, still in school for what, one more week? So, well, Ava graduates eighth grade tomorrow, actually. Good Lord, so how did that happen? No, I know That's she's grown up so insanity. fast. And little then Ava. Lucia finishes next week. It's like never ending for her, which yeah. she's, a, feels, she's on strike. She's like, I'm done. And then Alyssa is, star is starting all of her activity so the th you know the three littles i would say but they're not little anymore or things it, it, so i love summer because you actually i get to spend more time with my kids because they're not in school all the time based on right. my work schedule and things like that like ej's been out here since um saturday and i'm just loving every single day but a lot of parents are like oh god i can't wait for school to get back you know because it's more it's it's a lot more time it's a lot more taxing i mean are you yeah. the, the, like right now you're excited about it and then by what early august it'll be like okay it's time <laughs> <laughs> i love having them around and i love the house to be filled with all the girls but i do also believe that they have to find like viana le went left to north talking about north dakota went left to north dakota to go work at this maternity home it's there the, uh, and uh, yeah. you know and I, like i tell her i go i miss you but god has you on a journey and yeah. we all are oh, on a journey viana's, Even viana's you, got Larry. a mission man yeah, she but is. we all have a mission, and that's what's so beautiful about this world, you know, yeah. right, is what is your mission? And it starts even from your smallest communities, like the WMAL community. You are correct. It's a community. Let me rephrase family. that. We do all have a mission. Viana already knows what her mission is, which a lot of 21-year-olds <laughs> don't, you know. But Well, Viana's favorite line is, uh, if the Republic falls apart, she goes, I, I don't want to be an elected official, but I can be a general that comes in to rebuild it. <laughs> Her and Veronica. I'm just, I'm just, exactly. Your daughter and my daughter both take care of things. So I'm just glad I'm, I'm on their good side. All right. As yeah, I exactly. mentioned, Hans von Spakovsky is coming up at 635. And we're going to talk about the deals. You know, Hans is not only an election law expert. He worked in the DOJ and the voting rights division uh, and now at Heritage. He also happened to have been a election official in Fulton County, Georgia. I mean, he knows where wow. all the bodies are buried in Fulton County. And, yeah. of course, you know that uh, District Attorney Fonnie Willis has been attempting to prosecute Donald Trump 
and all of his lawyers and all of his advisors on a insanely interpreted RICO charge. It's amazing how these unprecedented criminal actions against Donald Trump all take these really unique and creative new interpretations of the law and apply them to Donald Trump. You would think that if he was such a bad guy and such a criminal that they wouldn't have to sort of interpret laws to apply to him. They could just say, hey, look, you broke the law. This is the law. You broke it. We're going to convict you. No, 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 no. In Manhattan, they have to come up with all this creative new way to look at the law. And the same right. thing with Rico in Fulton County. It's it's all it's got so well, obvious. Yeah, <laughs> no, and and we don't still quite know what the crime is in New York. There's no, like, we don't. this crime that they won't define right in New York, uh, with the potential, the real potential, of putting Donald Trump in jail. That's right. Wait a second. How many days before the convention? Four days before the convention. Yeah, four days this before is, the convention begins in Milwaukee, is, and Donald Trump has to go to a sentencing hearing. It's outrageous. And yeah. then you've got Fonny, Fanny, Fonny. Bonnie well, but- Willis with the RICO. And then you've got Jack Smith. You forget it's the Espionage Act that they're using in the classified materials oh, case. That, well, that one's already in suspended animation as the George, the judge down joke. there tries to but sort the out all of the misdeeds like, of the FBI. I, I know we have to wait to the Supreme Court to like, you know, for it to get up. That's to the for the Supreme J6 Court, this, case from Jack Smith here in D.C. But, yeah, we're waiting for that. But you, decision we're looking at down. this saying this is state prosecutor after state prosecutor going after a presidential candidate where they are wasting talk about millions of dollars between taxpayer dollars and like legal fees that Donald Trump has to pay. I know that doesn't add to the fact the stress that it's causing on the Trump family. I mean, this is and and by the way, the American people, this is this is an assault on voters. This is an assault on us. And by the way, the latest polls coming out of uh, after the Manhattan conviction is that Donald Trump has actually gotten a bump in the polls. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. <laughs> based on the conviction. All right, which brings us again back to Fulton County. Hans von Spakowski joining us to call more details at 635. But yesterday, Georgia's Court of Appeals has now officially put a complete and total grinding halt to the prosecution of Donald Trump as they hear arguments with regard to whether Fannie Willis should remain in her position prosecuting this case. As you know, Uh, A conflict of interest charge was brought up by one of the defendants in this RICO case because she was having an illicit affair with the private lawyer that she hired and gave funneled hundreds of thousands of tax dollars to to prosecute Donald Trump. The judge came in and basically split the baby in half and said, well, you can't both stay on the trial. You decide. And, of course, the lawyers for the defense said, no, neither of them should be on the trial. So they're appealing that judge's decision. And the Court of Appeals has now said that all proceedings will be paused until at least October when the appeals court will then hear oral arguments. But they're not going to come up with a decision until it's got to be after Election Day. So basically, the Fulton County, Georgia case is now it's it's it's, as far as the election is concerned on election day it's a complete non-story it doesn't it doesn't exist democrats are are crying i'm sure they're crying as is morning joe crying well Mm. they they need to prosecute and don't they can't pause these court proceedings i mean this is again this is such an abuse of our judicial system it is such an abuse on using these novel legal theories to try to take Donald Trump down, the political opponent. And it's got to stop. Like, right. quite frankly, there well, has to be a way that there, you know, that that the Supreme Court at some point rules and says enough. These Well, these the Supremes are ruling on the process. immunity question for Jack Smith's yeah. J6 prosecution and uh, Mark Levin and other leading, although he is really playing point on this, um, he is uh, begging states to sue the state of new york over the prosecution of oh Donald Trump, i thought that which, was a brilliant idea which then which then would take it to the supreme court and, yeah. and that that's a brilliant it is a brilliant, of course it's a brilliant idea it came from mark levin well although let's Jim face Jordan it has it, talked about defunding the department of justice and these um prosecutors and all, uh, and all the that cases. are involved in this and but, someone you know, needs to explain to me while all of this is going on what the hell is lindsey graham and mitt romney doing uh voting on biden judges there should be not one more action from the senate judiciary committee until all of this is cleaned up why why are we enabling the biden justice system to continue to chug along where are the republican senators stopping all of this mm, that's a great point insane great point
All right. Well, like I said, we'll give you more details on this Court of Appeals and uh, and where things stand with the Georgia case and the other cases when we talk to Hans von Spakovsky at 635. You like right now it's that, 540. Hans von Sp- hmm? so you can say it. Go ahead. <laughs> you say Hans. it so great. Hans von ha- Spakovsky. Spakovsky. Yeah. That's good. You've, you've got an say hour to practice. Say it fast five times. You've got, I, I can do it, but I need you I'm to do it. I'm just going to call him Hans. He'll be here Hans in 50 minutes. Solo. Larry Hogan, of course, is the Republican nominee for the U.S. Senate in Maryland, but he will not be attending the Republican National Convention in mid-July in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He announced this yesterday. Uh, I, it, what's the point of being a Republican nominee if you're going to spend your entire time distancing yourself from the Republican Party? You know, he, he could just run as an independent. <laughs> He could, I mean, that's but what it's he, hard or to is win a as Democrat, an independent. Yeah. Or you can, you know, but that's Mitt Romney, right? Mitt Romney's the same thing. They're like the beyond rhino Republicans. I mean, they take it to a whole new new uh, level. I think, I think, I think Hogan's a, a step further. I think I, it's it, it is frustrating for Maryland Republicans. I think we're used to this, though. He listen. I think he was a pretty good governor, all things considered, especially compared to the options we had for the as Dem- he was better than the Democrats he was running against. But he tends to use the Republican label as as like a, a costume that he puts on when he needs it to get his name on the ballot. But right. then he runs away from it. And I, I, I know all the smart guys tell me that that's how you can win in Maryland. I get it. That's fine. But I'm still a Republican. And I Frankly, I'm proud to be a Republican. There, there's something to be said for being a proud Republican in a state that is hostile to Republicans. And once in a while, we want a Republican who stands up for us, but he won't do it. He didn't give a reason why, but one assumes it's because he doesn't like Donald Trump and he doesn't want the Maryland voters to associate him with the Republican Party, which is kind of funny because he's the Republican nominee. Look, this is your state. I think it's pretty <laughs> messed up. But um, <laughs> I'll take Glenn, although we have to change our senators in um, in Virginia. Yeah, but you know. I, look, I it's good to have a Republican, but I think it's again he's Republican in, in name only, and um, and I think you know like it's it's good in terms of the numbers, but he will end up being a senator that is so wishy washy, like so I, the way I'll tell you. Mitt Romney is and several others, and, and it's kind. I'm and it's torn about this. If I knew for sure that Larry Hogan was going to be the one senator that tips the majority over to the Republicans, yeah, I will vote for him. If I think the Republicans already have the majority and we don't need Larry Hogan, I- I'm on the fence. I'll be honest with you. I will tell you this, though. Uh, yeah, we were just talking about J.D. Vance. We were talking about what a great guy J.D. Vance is. Ohio yeah. Republican Senator J.D. Vance said that um, it's reasonable to criticize Hogan, but he hopes he wins. He's he's behind Hogan. He wants that yeah. seat. He wants that majority because the Senate rides on it. So I get That's it. Right. I get it. It's just frustrating. But Hogan's going to do what Hogan's going to do. You know how Larry's are. Yeah, there's a thing. Uh, there's a there's, thing about Larry's. That's what I Larry's. Heard. Larry's are a, the they're Larry's. a they're a whole other animal. They're a lot to manage, to say the least. <laughs> it's five fifty-three. <laughs>